and bring up the PowerPoint. And uh, let's see if I can get this from the beginning. Okay, can everyone see that? Thumbs up? Okay, great. Okay, so um, if you were not aware of what SOPO Unite is, uh, we are one of the drug-free communities coalitions, and our mission is to create and sustain a safe, just, and healthy community to prevent youth substance use, really ages zero to 18. And uh, we are gonna talk about future aspirations and life after high school. Um, and this is our outline, is a little bit about the importance of why this topic is so important in substance use prevention and I'll talk a little bit about the brain and young people. Uh, our guests are gonna speak about their experiences and the paths that they've taken after high school. Meredith's gonna talk about the Youth Employee Assistance Program, which was helped, developed by SOPO Unite with the Opportunity Alliance. Um, also we'll talk a little bit about substance use on people's future, what kinds of things it can interfere with and a little bit about the high school to college transition, um, considerations for the future, things we could work on, and then a whole lot of resources that I'll put in the chat for people to have. And then we'll probably not do the jam board tonight, but that was an opportunity for parents to kind of share some of their uh, thoughts about future aspirations and, and life in the workplace when they were in high school, when Meredith talks about some of the work she's doing. So I wanted to start with just a little introduction about me and why this topic, future aspirations, has become really big in my world. Um, just a little background on me. I, uh, after I graduated from college at the University of New Hampshire, I stayed on and I was a hall director for 10 years. So I lived in the residence halls uh, with the students. And by the end of my 10 years, I lived with 600 students. And I think that's when I first uh, got a glimpse of how substance use can impact your college experience. Um, and I'd always think, I wish I could get to them sooner. And I was able, after I left UNH, to work for the Teen Institute. We actually worked with the Counter Drug Task Force down in New Hampshire and um, did prevention on underage drinking and tobacco use. And these young folks, they were middle school and high school kids, but they were kind of, not to say like goody goody kids, but they were very like, not probably gonna use substances while they were in these younger ages. And some would say like, I can't imagine ever being out of control. And um, so it was a great opportunity to do prevention, like true prevention with young people. Um, and then I moved to Maine and um, did some different jobs, but couple of the big ones I did was at the University of Southern Maine. I was the Assistant Director of Student Life and the Coordinator of Substance Use Prevention and Intervention. Um, and I also worked with the Higher Education Alcohol Prevention Partnership. So I worked with 20 of the campuses in the state and did all the trainings for like the residents, assistants, and faculty about prevention and intervention. And so that's kind of my background. I also have a master's degree in adult and higher education and also a master's degree in elementary education um, that I wanted to just say I have both of those degrees for free because I worked at university, so I never paid for my master's degrees. Um, and some of the things that um, I was able to do in those college settings is really to look at um, kind of why people are in college, that one out of four actually drop out their freshman year or transfer, but mostly it's dropping out. And just to think about like, oh my gosh, that's so huge and um, not good. Uh, and then with my current job, I've been in the high school for over four years now and a lot of aha moments happened for me where, and I'll talk a little bit about that later is, um, I think high schools think that colleges do a really great job at orientation for new students, which isn't really always true. And the colleges don't always do a great job at orientation, vice versa. Um, and so there's a lot of work I think we could improve on and there's some reasons why we need to do more work on this. Um, and one of the key things too, uh, if you see this, especially around marijuana use, 
It turns out if you look over on the bottom right, uh, future rate aspirations is a protective factor for mar marijuana use. And um, there's all these other pieces to it as well, but that really stood out when thinking about the importance of prevention. And we have a group of 90 high school students now that are in SoPo Unite. And a couple weeks ago, we had them do a jam board, so an anonymous brainstorm of future aspirations. And where do they get influenced about what they wanna do next? Who are the people? Uh, and what do they think about doing next? And almost everyone, there was about 25 students that day, almost everyone wrote that their parents were the most significant factor in their future aspirations. So that's why tonight's topic for parents is big because your, your young people really are looking to you for that structure, that advice, um, all of that. So we are going to do a little bit more about just again, uh, uh, around learning and substance use. And I'll just go through these really quickly. So alcohol and marijuana specifically interfere with young persons, really anybody's uh, abstract and critical thinking skills. So that means thinking about things, figuring out things that are not right in front of you that you have to figure out. So it could be classes and you think of all the STEM classes um, it can be playing an instrument, playing a sport, working on cars, um, all those things. And so some people say, well, just don't drink while you're doing puzzles and you'll be all set. But it actually has a 72 hour impact on those skills. So if someone's drinking and in college, students would say, well, I'm just drinking Thursday and Saturday nights. What's the big deal? I'm not like drinking during class, but that would leave them with maybe one day a week with those skills working. Alcohol also interferes with the REM sleep. So people don't go into REM where we do um, overall immune system kind of gets recovered. Anything you learn during the day gets stored into long-term memory in REM sleep. And we actually do problem solving in REM sleep, which is pretty awesome. So I often say to students, have you ever gone to bed at night like fretting about something and then somehow you get a good night's sleep and you wake up and you're like, I can do this, I'm good all is well, like sleep on it, um, that probably that person had REM sleep, was got into REM, one of the deepest phases. Now with REM sleep, your dendrites and synapses connect, and that's where you do problem solving. But if you drink more than five drinks for males, more than four for females, you actually don't go into REM sleep. So you can see, especially with college students or anybody using in higher risk ways, that they're not getting good overall sleep. And that's really critical for functioning. Uh, we also know marijuana and alcohol interfere with people's short-term memory. So someone can remember stuff from way back, but things that just happened, they can't recall. And so any kind of learning, whether it's in a job or in school or on the field or any kind of activity, uh, short-term memory is really critical. And then a couple last ones um, we see with marijuana, especially is lower verbal IQ which doesn't mean someone's not smart, but they can't access words as well. So if I were to hold up this glass, this plastic cup, and you were to shout out as many words as you could to describe it, um, you could think of a lot, like it's got holes, it's turquoise, it's got, it sounds like it's got ice in it, on and on. But if I'm impaired, and even not right when I'm using, I might not be able to think of more than one or two words, like plastic, shiny, um, and now write a five page paper, little tricky. Um, and then focus, some people say, hey, like marijuana really helps me focus. I can get in the zone and really just like get in there and you know tune everything else out. Um, but what can happen is a rebound effect that someone when their marijuana is leaving their brain, then the opposite of that happens and that they're not able to focus and they are easily distracted. So they might continue to use to get back in to that focusing. Um, it's really an inability to shift attention to something else. So uh, one of the things also I do on the side is I teach the class for folks who've been arrested for operating under the influence. And I'm seeing a lot more marijuana OUIs and people who are you know, under 21 who are using daily and have their medical marijuana cards, and some of them are there for marijuana OUIs. 
Um, and then lastly, state dependent restriction. If someone learns something when they're sober, it's best recalled when they're sober again. But if they learn something when they're impaired on any substance, they're actually better at it when they're impaired again. So if you think about in the beginning, usually these are social skills that someone, it's easier to talk to people at a party or play beer pong or pool or darts or dancing. Um, and so that's in the beginning. Over time, someone can have more skills tied up in this. And so that can lead to someone using more often to access skills. I always have to ask young people like uh, in the deep class, raise your hand if you had a teacher in high school that you think probably was impaired while teaching. And pretty much everyone can think of somebody, and I won't ask you all to raise your hands, but thinking back like, oh, I bet that one teacher, you know, drank out of his thermos or, you know, so that might be, again, state dependent restriction. So those things, and just a few more before we get our guest speakers to share. Um, the brain's not fully developed until our mid 20s, and that's the prefrontal cortex right here, judgment, reasoning, and caution. But it's ready to take risks at 13. So I might do something in seventh or eighth grade, risky, because that part's ready to go. And it's not till 12 years later that my brain says that probably wasn't a good idea. So we have young people and the best for learning from 13 to 20 without much effort. So you think about the students that can, um, oh good, we have one more guest speaker coming. Um, the best for learning, you can see students who play a number of sports, number like five different instruments. We have students that can speak four or five languages. And again, really easy to learn things without much effort from that period. Um, but also addiction starts during that time. So if it, I teach it something not good, that too can stick. So the work we do in prevention right now is critical to delay use so that the brain can learn and be best at it right now and gather um, good skills and not substance use skills. Um, and then just, just some other pieces up here that you could read uh, and know that that's part of what can happen um, as students get older and uh, leave high school that some of these things are going on. So this next piece, if I can get this to go, um, a little bit more about this, that for young people and after high school, there's unstructured free time, the belief that alcohol and other drug use, that everyone's doing it, I'm only young once, I'll sleep when I'm dead, um, you know, college, the best six years of your life. I've seen that t-shirt. That's great. Um, so just kind of normalizing it. And then there's a lot of uh, aggressive marketing. There are over 15,000 flavored tobacco products. Over 15,000. Um, that's insane. So really think about that. And then it's really available and inexpensive for young people to access substances. Um, and then depending on where someone's working or in school, uh, laws and policies might not always be enforced consistently. So I wanna turn it over now. We have some folks here and uh, each of them is gonna share a little bit about their path and that one of the things we've discovered in working in South Portland in the Gateway to Opportunity Program is the students last summer did a project about the stigma of not going to college and that they really felt like unless you're going to college you're kind of on your own so at the end i'm going to share a number of resources that you can pass on to your young people about the different paths someone could take so i'm going to turn it over to todd and if you'll share a little bit about your pathway and your journey sure so I did the usual high school experience. I went to Mexico High School, which is now part of Mountain Valley. And I was a probably a little bit higher than average student. And there was the expectation that I would go to college like all of my friends. And I got accepted. I, I wanted from a long time uh, to be a police officer. And I had got accepted to University of Maine at Orono and got my dorm assignment. And along with that a dorm assignment, I got my first bill from college and asked my father for the $500 deposit. And he said, I don't have $500. How about you join the Air Force, which had never really entered my mind. The military wasn't 
really a consideration. But I, I'm uh, pretty driven. I was motivated to become a police officer and the thought of going to college for four years um, or joining the Air Force and becoming a police officer in about six months. So that's what I did. And right out of basic training and then technical school, which is the Air Force's version of the uh, police academy, I, I did that, was assigned over and to uh, Great Britain at Greenham Common, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. And I, I just, I had a fantastic um, four years in the military and obviously participated in the uh, GI Bill and which paid for my college when I got hired at South Portland um, four years later. And it was, I thought, a, a, a great experience. It taught me commitment and discipline and um, follow through and integrity. It was, uh, it was just a, a, a great experience, one of four of the best years of my life. I, I came back over after my uh, two years in England, came back to the United States, and I was stationed at Hanscom in Massachusetts. Um, I was on the, the base SWAT team, which just I was telling Leanne an interesting story that um, back in 88 or 89, I don't remember what year it was, that we had a, a SWAT, we participated in a SWAT competition, and I participated against Nemlik who uh, at the time was officer Tim Sheehan was on the Nemlik team. And then 30 years later, he's hired as our, as our chief. And we got discussing it that, oh, I was at that competition. So while I was in the Air Force, just kind of, kind of an interesting uh, story. I got out of the uh, Air Force, which is a difficult decision to make because it's, it was stable. I was being paid at the time. Um, by the way, my, my uh, time in the uh, Air Force was pretty routine. It was during peacetime. Um, we, we bombed uh, Libya during that time, and we had the, uh, all of the uh, West German disco bombings that were going on at the time that I was over in England, but pretty, really pretty routine, um, lackluster four years for, as far as that went compared to what uh, the, the sergeant is uh, seeing right now in, in his service. Um, but I got out in, uh, in 1990 and immediately was picked up by South Portland Police Department. And I, I believe based on my experience with the, uh, with the Air Force and, and the experience that I had as a police officer uh, in the military uh, contributed to my getting that job and rising through the ranks, and ranks as a uh, sergeant and then now a, a lieutenant at South Portland PD. Um, and it's something that I, I wouldn't trade for anything. It was a, it was a great experience. And I'm sure that, uh, that, uh, Sergeant Gauthier will, uh, will, uh, echo those, but uh, I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions. If somebody does have any questions. Thanks Todd. And we'll, and if people want to put things in the chat too, you can, um, awesome. And, you know, Todd and I were talking about back in the day. In World War II, it was such an, you know, so much honor about being in the military. And then you had Vietnam where that dropped. And then, you know, again, kind of that stigma of going into the military has changed. So it's, you know, there's not that stigma, but also wanting to encourage young people to think about a variety of paths um, and that there's people out there. And we're going to have Todd and Jason. Jason doesn't know this yet, but we want them to come and present to students too about this. Um, so no pressure. And Jason, will you tell us about your path? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. <clears throat> I didn't have quite as much prepared as Todd, but uh, I was, uh, you know, I went to Stanford High School and uh, at the time, as I don't think any high schooler would know what they want to do, I had no idea. Uh, my family's not military, um, nor were they really college educated. Um, and so I was just kind of looking for my own path. And uh, the Air National Guard recruiters came into my class and I kind of did a little presentation and uh, my assumption of the military not really having family in the service was like, hey, you ship out for four years, you know, you kind of travel the world, but they kind of tell you what to do and where to go. And uh, I found out with the National Guard, um, you were able to, you know, stay in your state. Um, it's kind of a part time thing. You stay in your state. Um, what really drew me to the National Guard was kind of their support of Ice Storm 98, which was a long time ago, but they kind of use that as a highlight of their service to other Mainers, right? So it wasn't just about being in the military, it was also about serving Maine. So 
uh, I was really drawn to that. Um, I was a, I was a good student. I was an A and B student, you know, um, I just didn't love it. And, uh, so the military kind of gave me that breath of fresh air in between high school and college. And, uh, so I was able to go off, get my training done. What I learned while I was in training is a lot of that training was actually accredited through a university that the air force has and counted towards an associate's degree. So when I was done with my eight months of training, I was already almost to an associate's degree. So at that point, I decided to go to um, SMCC at the time and uh, finish out my associates on the USM to get a bachelor's in business. And, uh, you know, uh, I only have the Air Force experience. I can't really speak to other services, but um, I was just surprised as I got in how many other members had bachelor's degrees and college education. And uh, the best part about it all is it came free to us. So. Um, I just think for someone that's kind of teetering and doesn't quite know what path to go in, there's so many options available with the military. You know, it's not all infantry. It's not all, you know, there's cybersecurity things. Now we got guys that work for Amazon um, and do the military part-time through the national guard. So it's just a really good opportunity for a lot of people. Um, I think it kind of gets a bad rap is kind of a fallback option for those that, that didn't excel in school or couldn't find another path. And um, that's just not the case for, for the new age military that I see. So um, as you spoke about Vietnam and stuff, you know, it, it hasn't always been this um, prestigious, I'd say, to be in the military. Right now we have a really good reputation with the community. Um, part of that is just what I love, you know, so I go back to the community support stuff that we're able to do with the National Guard and that's what really drives me. So I thought I'd do like four or six years and uh, here I am looking at 17 here pretty soon and, uh, and almost retired. So it's been an amazing experience. Um, you know, it's, it's given me the degree. We have traveled all over the world, good places and bad. Um, you know, but there's only been one time since 9-11 that they've activated our members to go against their will. Um, most of it's all voluntary. We got another deployment coming up next year and uh, 62 people are required and 68 volunteered. So it's not exactly like, hey, they're gonna tell you where to go and, and just you're gonna deploy all the time. So um, same thing goes for the good trips. You know, if you can go to Europe this week, they take volunteers on only so um it's just a really good opportunity i've had the best luck um uh i was able to actually land a full-time job with the national guard as well there's a lot of full-time positions that kind of keep the service running in the state while others um only do the weekend work so i've been active now for about 12 years all the same benefits as active duty except i'm tied to the state so it's been uh, just a really great experience. I've gotten to work with the DEA and um, FBI, Homeland Security, a bunch of different agencies here in the state. And uh, it's just an experience I couldn't have found elsewhere. So, you know, I wish more parents were on tonight, but if anyone uh, has any questions, um, I'd be happy to, you know, bring someone in for the day and show them around without the pressure of a recruiter and stuff and just kind of talk more about my experience. Awesome, thank you so much. and. You know, the high school usually does do a career night or a career fair, and I really want us to help beef that up to make sure it's got a wide variety, and I don't know if they'll be able to do it this year, but um, we really want to make sure that students know about options that they have, and while we have contact with students. Um, hey, Meredith, tell us about your experience with AmeriCorps. Sure thing. Okay. Um, I, I did end up going to college right after high school and AmeriCorps was my path um, kind of after college, but I wanted to talk about it because I wish I had known about it um, right after high school. And I think it's a really like underutilized opportunity that just a lot of people like haven't heard about. Most people know about Peace Corps, but they don't know about AmeriCorps so much. And um, a little bit more of a low commitment option if you're trying to just do something different for a year after high school or after college like I did. Um, so it's also a form of national service for um, anyone who's 18 or older, although I know some programs accept um, 16 to 17 year olds. And um, there's AmeriCorps programs in all 50 states too. So for me, it was like a really great way to also travel. I did AmeriCorps out in Colorado, which was a place I had also wanted to visit. Um, and that was like a really fun experience for me. Um, and so kind of the way it works is you are in partnership with a nonprofit. So for me, it was a, a food security nonprofit um, and they could be as small as like a one person nonprofit, which is what I work for, or like as big as Habitat for Humanity. Um, and you commit to service any like any amount between six months and two years, depending on the program. Um, and so throughout the course of your service, you get like a, a living stipend, which is like not very much money, um, but kind of the incentive is that at the end of your service, you get 
um, an education award, and that can be used for um, either past student loans or future education. Um, and uh, they have like a whole variety of programs, anything from doing teaching, like Teach for America, um, doing disaster relief, economic opportunity, um, Healthy Futures, which is like what I did. Um, so there's just a whole lot of options out there. That's a great way to learn some new skills. Um, I didn't know a thing about farming before I went to my job, and now I can like drive a tractor and like planted four acres of food. So I thought that was really cool to just see how much you can learn in a year. Um, I feel like there's a lot of professional growth and personal growth um, that's an option, and I think it really influenced like where I am now in my career, wanting to um, continue in, in some kind of service um, to people. Um, and then just real quick, there's kind of like three big branches of AmeriCorps that people tend to go for. Um, and so there's state national, which is what I did, and that's like direct hands-on service. So doing like uh, Habitat for Humanity is one example of that, or like farming. Um, and then there's AmeriCorps NCCC, um, which stands for the National Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, and that one always seems really fun to me. It's like you're in a crew of uh, 10 people and you're traveling around to different sites doing hands-on conservation work. That one's pretty rugged. Um, it sounds like a whole lot of fun. Um, and then there's AmeriCorps VISTA, which is just indirect service. So doing more like administrative capacity building stuff within a nonprofit. Um, and that option is really neat because if you complete AmeriCorps VISTA, you get non-competitive eligibility into government jobs, which I think is similar to like military and Peace Corps service as well. So you get to be considered um, apart from like the regular applicant pool. So it can be a really good um, like trajectory into that if that's what you're interested in. So whole lot of options with AmeriCorps. Um, I'm really, really glad that I, uh, that I chose to do that for a year. And um, I have a lot of friends who have done it as well and had great experiences. So um, yeah, happy to talk more if people have questions. Awesome, thank you. And Alice is new, but she just joined us. Alice, will you introduce yourself and tell us what you're doing? You're on week three of your new job. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you today? Um, my name is Alice Kabore, and I am actually the Multicultural and Multilingual Coordinator in South Portland School Department. I'm just a new hire and my job is to make sure um, to help the new, the non-English speakers to be, to integrate the school and also help parents and orient them anything about schooling and, uh, just, and, uh, and the community integration. I'm just new, I'm also learning about uh, <laughs> this new program and I'm so happy to join you tonight and looking forward to learning a lot from you. And also, you can also feel free to ask me questions if you need to know some of the things. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. And uh, no, no, no. Just, just a couple of things about um, our students who there is a, you know, at the end, there's a whole bunch of resources. And I think I'll just send all of you because I know all of you and I have all your emails, um, just all the resources that way instead of putting them in the chat. But one of the cool programs that Portland High School has is something called Make It Happen, and it helps students who are um, multicultural students that might need support in finding uh, colleges and applying for schools, and there are volunteers that can help with academics and helping students apply for schools. And I met with some of the um, seniors who are uh, organizing and just starting up the Black Student Union and they were talking to me the other day and they said you know when they went to the guidance counselors they didn't really felt like they didn't encourage them to dream big they kind of said like well you can go to a local school and you know um, and these three students now are going to Dartmouth, Brandeis University, and Vassar um, these three students, uh, women, and they would like to start this Make It Happen program in South Portland to really help other students. So uh, I just wanted to, to mention that, that we're really going to expand um, how we can support all students in, in getting to their next thing, you know, their next future aspiration. So welcome, Alice, and we're going to now turn it back to Meredith, who's going to talk about YEEP, and a lot of you on here are familiar with it, um, and just thinking about that we also want young people who have experiences in learning skills and working 
at, in high school and beyond, and that sometimes that environment can be risky around substance use, and Meredith's going to talk all about this, but um, we, you know, there's been some pediatricians that have said, don't let your kid work when they're in high school. It's too risky, especially in the hospitality industry. You don't want them working. Um, so Meredith's going to talk about how we're going to ensure that this is a positive experience for young people. So take it away, Meredith. Right. Yeah. Hey again, everyone. Um, so I'm going to uh, introduce Yeep. Um, by talking about uh, young people in the workplace and kind of some of the risks and benefits of that. Um, and so working is a really common choice for young people um, during high school, maybe during a summer break, um, and of course going on after high school. Um, and given that parents, as we know, have a big influence on future aspirations, it's really important to know um, what the risks and the opportunities are that come with that choice. So like Leanne was saying earlier, um, we know that the brain is primed for learning new skills at adolescence. Um, so young people can pick up skills quicker than older employees can. And this can be really exciting for a young person to experience um, and also exciting for the employer to have that person on their team. Um, working at a young age also builds up your work ethic and teaches time management skills in a really like real world way that sometimes you can't get from other experiences in high school. Um, it's also an opportunity to have some responsibility and independence at a time when things can really feel like they're just dictated by forces outside of you or things are decided for you, just a chance to have some ownership in your life. We also know that time spent in work uh, leaves less time for risk taking outside of work and getting in trouble, which is always good. Um, and nothing teaches financial skills like having a job, seeing the value of money, really making that connection between having a paycheck and having money to spend. So then on the flip side, um, one thing parents are often concerned about is the impact of working on academic performance. And we do know that working more than 20 hours a week while in school is negatively correlated with academic performance. And so with the developing brain piece, um, having that like brain prime for risk taking also means that you're more vulnerable to learning habits that can be really harmful. And one of these habits that can be present um, in a workplace environment is substance use. Right, especially in jobs that attract young people. We know that in certain industries, the culture could be really permissive and enabling of substance use. It's kind of seen as like a rite of passage. Um, and so another statistic to go with that is that if you're working more than 26 hours, your risk of substance use increases significantly. So in substance use prevention, one industry we've been super wanting to work with and partner with is the food and hospitality industry. And this is because it's the second largest employer in Maine and um, of young people working in Maine, over a third of them are employed in this industry. Um, and prior to YEAP, there were no workplace initiatives focusing um, particularly on young people and really addressing that environment as a whole. Um, some other reasons why we wanted to work with this industry is that they have the highest rates of substance use disorder, past month illicit drug use, and suicidal ideation. And since we know that substance use and mental health are like really closely related, it's important to look at those issues as a whole and kind of see what factors are driving it. So um, in seeing this need with young people, um, Emily De Silva, who probably a lot of you know and have worked with, spent um, months and months of her job just analyzing data and um, talking to the community partners, um, looking at related workplace initiatives and ended up creating this program called EAP. Um, and the mission is right here. You guys can all read it. Um, and it stands for the Youth Employment Assistance Program. So in action, YEEP is really meant to be this active and ongoing program for employers to make a continued effort to uh, improving workplace culture and supporting young people. So we really don't want this to be like a one-off box check kind of thing. We want this to be um, a long-term commitment. And so when businesses decide to participate, the first step is for myself to sit down with them and go through the employer toolkit. And um, the employer toolkit is a really comprehensive resource that starts with um, primarily the financial breakdown of the impact of substance use on business. And I think this can be really um, surprising for people to see and also just super important given that this is an industry where profit um, is the number one goal. And so knowing that this is impacting your bottom line and that addressing this is not just going to be good for your employees, but also for your business. Um, and the toolkit also goes through some other benefits of addressing substance use, kind of what substance use looks like with employees, um, and then tips on how to create a substance-free work, work environment. And um, this piece is important to acknowledge that the cultures and norms um, in the workplace can influence behavior as much as, if not more than policies for young people um, with developing brains that are so impressionable to that environment around them. 
So another part of YEEP is to go through the specific workplace needs with the business, knowing that every business is different and looking at what policies are already in place and how can we adapt those um, and better implement them um, and really encouraging employers to consider an early intervention approach and use supportive practices when issues do arise with young people. So rather than just like firing them or reprimanding them for really taking that restorative approach. Um, and so in addition to the toolkit, we offer a lot of resources to connect employees with if you're worried about them, resources like mental health, 211, things like that. Um, and we include this poster uh, for their breaker that has the signs of addiction and independence on it. And that's um, the SoCo Unite Kids really helped create that. It has a lot of great visuals. Um, and I think that's just a good one to have up. And um, we offer, also offer some future trainings for the continuing education requirement. Um, so a lot of exciting things happening around YEEP. The CDC is taking it statewide. They're working on a plan to implement it, um, but they're really looking at us for the pilot uh, here in Cumberland County. So we're going to get businesses YEEP certified, um, and once they're certified, we can really start to promote them um, to other businesses. And we really think that this is the way that it's going to catch on, um, just by getting the word out and, and promoting the it as much as we can, so that it can eventually become the standard for young people. So. Really quick, some tips for parents. Um, if you have young people working, or I know some of you said you have like middle schoolers or early high school, so probably going into thinking about having their first job. Um, these are just four things you can do um, to have a better outcome around that. So first one is having clear expectations around substance use. Um, we all know that this is generally a major protective factor from data. Um, kids whose parents disapprove of use are much less likely to use, and this also goes for the workplace as well. Um, number two is just keeping that conversation open, asking about the position and the work environment. Like, what is it like? Is it high stress? Do you feel like you have support from your management? Um, what are the norms like in the workplace? Is it really engaging work or are you just doing really repetitive tasks like washing dishes? We know that that's also a risk factor for substance abuse. And just making it a safe space if they do want to come to some questions about substances. Um, so knowing the federal rules for working teenagers, um, the US government sets regulations on the number of hours you can work while at high school. Um, and it's different for 14 and 15 year olds than it is for 16 and 17. So just making sure that uh, those are uh, in compliance. Uh, and then last tip is if your kid is working uh, late shift to be awake when they come home. And this is like the number one thing, if you take anything away from this. Um, it's really just the best outcome. It takes away that incentive to use. Um, I know from personal experience that this works because my parents did it all throughout my high school job and it drove me crazy, but it worked. I had no desire to come home uh, intoxicated when I had to have a conversation with my dad at 1 a.m. So uh, if your kid does have a job, do this. Um, very important. So that's all I have about Yeep. Um, if people have questions, please reach out to me. Um, I really think this has so much potential and we're really looking to get it off the ground. So thanks for listening. <laughs> Great, and I'm sorry we don't have like more time because this was gonna be a whole hour or longer just on Yeep, but I will say this, um, Meredith came to our SOPA Unite student meeting and we did again an anonymous jam board and we, the question was, is if you have a job right now, are there substances at it? And almost everyone said, yes, there is. Or my friend said there is where she works and there's marijuana or vaping or drinking and they did, they got really specific about Yes, and these are students, right? Ninth through really 11th graders. We don't have a lot of seniors. So to just see that pop up, I think Meredith and I were like, oh my gosh, it really is true. It really is happening. Um, and that we really want students to have a good work experience. And uh, some students will say, yeah, it's happening at my work, but I, ha I need the job. So I can't, you know, or it's my boss who's doing it. You know, like, so just one of the things is Meredith's gonna create a training for youth um, so they're prepared to be in the workplace. So she's going to work with our students to create a youth training on YEEP. Um, and again, more information will be coming out. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it's also in the governor's opioid strategic plan to use YEEP um, and to really help people uh, and, and recovery. And then 211 has its own YEEP section now so that if people call 211 it can go directly to the resources for somebody so there's a lot of great stuff Meredith it's in good hands with you so <laughs> thank you so just a few more things to go over tonight um, one of the other things we created years ago was some information and there's a little mean rack card that Al Justo helped us recreate um, and it used to be called your degree doesn't matter but what it is, is now we change it to who knew, 
And what it means is that if someone were to get a criminal record for substance use issues, furnishing alcohol, getting an OUI, um, et cetera, et cetera, that can stay on your record for a while and it can interfere, especially with um, licensed professions, including getting your CDL license for driving, a lot of different things. Um, but we often share this with students and there's a long list of different professions that if you were to get a record, you may not be able to do that profession for a, a period of time. It's everything from teaching to medical professions to law enforcement to a lot of things. And I use this in, again in health classes and I have people kind of raise their hand if they hear the career that they're thinking about. It could be real estate agent and a lot of different, you know, you know, working, again, teaching was a big thing. Um, so just for people to think about, especially with driving and OUIs, that could, that stays on your license for 10 years. And um, there's many different countries you aren't allowed to travel to for that 10 years. You can't get into Canada, many other um, countries uh, can interfere with going into the military. Um, and so just having people, again, the more prevention we can do before they get to that point um, and they're over 18 and they do something um, and not super intentionally, but that can really interrupt someone's career path. And, and people, oftentimes parents are like, give me that rack card, I wanna read it. So just think about that risk. And then a few last things I'd like to share with you is again, my experience of working in colleges and in high school now, which I love that I've been able to have that experience of both worlds. Um, what I realized my first year was learning more about the brain and that we have senior privilege at South Portland where um, students, seniors who are doing, you know, okay or better academically, they have senior privilege where they can kind of like come and go during the day. Like, you know, I don't really have a class till 10, so I'm not getting there till 10 or I'm going to leave at noon and go to a mottos or whatever. And, and I would watch this like in and out. And then we even practice it with the juniors. Like they start having senior privilege the spring before their seniors, like coming and going. And it struck me because I thought, wait a minute, you're a senior and you kind of know what you're doing next by March, let's say, like you're going to college or you're going in the military or whatever your next thing is kind of figured out. Then you kick back because there's nothing really due the rest of the year, like almost nothing, maybe some finals, but that's a ways off. Um, and then if you're going to college, you might not have anything due, like an exam, until October of the next year. So that means seven months you have done almost nothing of rigor with your brain. Again, your brain's best for learning from 13 to 20, and now you haven't really done anything from March till October. And then all the things come into play. And uh, uh, things to think about is that our high school students are in school when COVID's not around, um, typically for almost 30 hours a week, they're in class, they're in the building, they're in school. In college, they might only be in class for 12 to 15 hours. And for every hour in class in college, you're supposed to do two to three hours on your own. Now, if you talk to some high school students, like I never really had to do too much homework ever. Um, or what well, I could do it like the night before. Um, and so in college, you might only have two exams for that whole course. Now, if you do poorly on the October midterm, which is usually halfway through October, now you only have a final left. And some of the things that are critical about learning in college is that professors are there um, typically not to teach. That's not their top priority. Their top priority is their subject and doing research. And then maybe teaching is down second or third of their importance, where they are the sage on the stage. And then in high school, though, teachers really often are in it for teaching, that they love working with young people, and they give extra credit, and you can, you know, have an extension on your homework and there's quizzes and there's school ha help after school and then you get to college and now I've got to go to office hours of this professor that I'm kind of afraid of because this is their favorite subject and right now I have to tell them I'm not doing well in it. 
Um, so one of the things is colleges and universities has all these great resources, but students have to ask for help themselves. And again, what I noticed in the high school is that all day long, there'll be people like, well, Todd Bernard, please come down to guidance. And you know, there's just people on you like, Meredith, where are you supposed to be right now? Um, there's people all around. Now, when you go to college, way more free time. And we know that there's 168 hours in the week. And if someone gets eight hours of sleep a night, eight hours of classes and studying, four hours of getting ready, they have 44 hours of free time left of nothingness. And you think like, is everyone getting eight hours of sleep? Is everyone in class eight hours and studying a day? So it could be even more than 44 hours of unstructured time. So really thinking about that shift from high school to college is big or the workplace, where they go next. Um, so I think those are some things that people don't really get until they get to wherever they're going and they realize, oh my gosh, this transition is huge. And when I was a hall director, I remember students saying to me, what time do we have to be in tonight? I was like, oh, you don't have to be in ever, right? You're like, there's not a curfew. You don't have to be in by 11. Um, so just that shift of not having parents around, not having teachers and guidance counselors around, that there's these resources, but you have to go ask for help if you need it. So that's a huge shift that people aren't always ready for. Um, and then just some other considerations, I'll send these to you, but just really having students thinking about um, making sure to go to orientation and that we should probably have some things due at the end of senior year so that it's not a waste of seven months. So Cape Elizabeth High School, I know Megan's on here and she works at the library in Cape Elizabeth, but they have to do a senior project where they have to do a project for a couple weeks and then present it in front of all the teachers of some learning. And it could be anything that you're interested in. Um, and I think Michelle LaForge is thinking about someday doing that at our school so that you know, that they have something that they're working towards and getting some experience. So here's a lot of resources that um, I'll send to all of you. I don't know if you heard that there's going to be free summer courses at the community colleges this summer for students. So that's awesome. Also for our LGBTQ youth, um, there's a cool Campus Pride Index website where you can look up every school in the country and see how inclusive they are for LGBTQ youth. And that's been really great to just kind of look at, uh, you want your young person to, to be in a welcoming environment. Um, and again, a lot of other programs here locally and um, SERP is the Student Intervention and Reintegration Program, which is the same curriculum we teach for the DEEP class. So if you are worried about your young person, intervening now is better than treatment later. Um, let's get on. If we're worried about our young people now, this is the opportunity. Um, also, PATHS, um, the Portland Arts and um, Technology High School, it, we only have 20 students going there this year because they didn't get the orientation. Not enough kids went last spring to go to the orientation. So we usually have like 60 students going there. But there's a great video if you want to show your young people about the different opportunities at PATHS. So Gateway to Opportunity, that's the kids that did the project on the stigma of not going to college. So there's two big long lists of a lot of things around apprenticeships and scholarships um, that again, I'll send to folks. So we're gonna end tonight with just an open, um, I was gonna have people do a jam board, but since it's all of us, I'm going to stop sharing and welcome anybody else's um, thoughts about how we can do a better job at supporting young people with life after college, I mean, life after high school and finding what they're passionate about um, and how to get support if you're not sure how to go about it. So anybody that didn't get to talk, you talk first, anybody's thoughts. This is me making space for someone else to go first because I feel like I always go first, but I guess I'll go. Um, is that what you want? Just me to, or who, what those who yeah. were any thoughts, any thoughts anybody has about this topic? Yeah. Um, I think it's mega important. Um, I, first of all, thank you for 
for presenting this, um, Leanne. Just a wonderful job, and the speakers, um, the other speakers tonight were wonderful. I learned so much, and oh my gosh, 